Hello, everyone. Thank you for coming. It's uh, my pleasure to introduce my good friend, Kate uh, Van Bramer, uh, who is a partner at MMB, and she's going to be talking about considerations for growing your brewery. So here you go. Here, Kate. Thanks, Chris. Um, I'm going to sit down, so if anybody can't hear me, um, feel free to raise your hand, and I'll start standing up. Um, but I always feel a little lightheaded when I give a speech, so just fair warning, that's why I'm sitting. Um, and again, I passed out my business card to a couple people. If you're looking for the slides, there's absolutely nothing proprietary in these slides, so if you don't want to write a tax form down or you can't remember exactly what the credit is, feel free to grab a business card. I'm more than happy to share this slide with you or something you can give your um, controller, bookkeeper, whoever's going to need to do this. Um, information. So I'm going to go through a quick agenda. Um, we're going to start with some exploratory questions in terms of growing your brewery, what your goals are, um, trying to get the juices flowing after lunch. Um, go through some financing options. So in terms of the debt model versus the equity model, we'll go through some pros and cons related to both of those. Um, looking at some tax credits, so some specifically for expansion and investment in the brewery, as well as you know those operating type tax credits that just leave a little more cash flow in the brewery. Um, there have been some pretty significant changes to the R and D tax credit, which I hope everybody in here is taking advantage of. You know, you're not putting out the exact same beer over and over, so everyone is. Um, doing something in this R&D arena, but we'll talk a little bit about those changes. Um, and we'll end with a recap of the employee retention credit. So um, something that we've talked about in the past, this was really a program that came out of COVID in 2020 and 2021. You're probably asking why we're still talking about it. Um, and that really goes back to the fact that you have to amended tax form and that sunset for the amending period is coming due in July. Um, it starts to sunset in July of the current year. So that opportunity is closing. Um, probably hearing more commercials online of, are you eligible for this $26,000 tax credit? And it's somewhat of, have you gotten met mesothelioma from Fort Bragg? They probably go hand in hand. Um, but this is a legit credit, so if you're eligible for it, I certainly want you to have the information to go ahead and apply for that. Um, so just a couple questions to ask yourself. Um, I know you've probably started um, with a question of how large of a system do I need to go? And I think probably three years in, it seems like that's the magic number. Is, is that big enough and do I need to expand that system? So how are you going to do that? How are you going to finance it? Um, it comes down to how frequently do you want to use that system? How frequently do you want to brew? Um, what types of beer are you making? And really, how long is the tank life for some of those? Do they need to ferment longer than others? Can you crank through them a little bit faster? So all of those questions kind of go into how much financing you're going to need to take on uh, to pay for that equipment. Also, what's your ultimate goal? You know. Um, the keynote speaker today did a great job of you're in so many different segments. There's some that are production-based breweries. You might have a small tap room all the way to you running a full-scale restaurant on the side in addition to brewing beer and everything else you do that you're required to do. So all of those are going to kind of come into what you need to finance and how. So we're going to start with the debt portion of financing. Um, probably the one that most people think of when you think of um, buying equipment. Um, really kind of run the full gamut, so there's a lot out there. The merchant cash advance, that's your square loan. Um, you're really taking an advance against your future sales based on your current sales. Think of it as a short-term model, it's probably going to have a higher interest rate. So something to consider, are you going to um, you know, continue on that same sales trajectory? Do you want a, a little quicker, a little bit easier to get that money? Um, both the micro loan and the SBA loan are government-backed programs, so the SBA has different qualifications. Um, typically, they have a little bit more upfront compliance costs related to those. Um, they'll have a lower interest rate, and it, that's really because the bank is allowing or 
it letting having the government take on some of that risk in addition to the bank itself, so they're not taking on the whole um, function themselves. Personal loans, I think you everyone knows what that is, and then all the way to a traditional term debt loan, which is probably what you think of the most when you're financing a piece of equipment. So the pros related to financing versus equity, um, it's typically quicker, especially if you have an established banking relationship. And I will say a little plug, I know the M&T guys are running around here and I don't see them in here, but I will say if you have an established banking relationship, as much as you should think of your attorney and your CPA as part of your business team, you know, you should really think of your banker as that part of that business team too, you know. It might feel like I'm loaning money or taking money from them and I, I want them to think I'm doing good, but I don't want them to have the same conversation as if I'm struggling. If you bring them into that conversation quicker, um, their ultimate goal is to get repaid, right? So they wanna work with you. Your success is gonna turn into their success. So having an open, honest banking relationship I think is critical for all businesses, especially a growing business. Um, a debt finance can really be um, pretty flexible in terms of based on your needs. So you could have a short term, more of a line of credit revolving type debt. And that's typically used when what you're purchasing, um, either materials or inventory, can be turned into sales a little bit quicker. Um, it could be a long-term investment, so you're looking to buy a new tank, a new financing, or a new system, a new uh, bright tank, a new something um, in the back of the house. So you want to finance that, but it's going to take a little bit longer for that to translate into revenue. Um, they're known terms, so you know the interest rate. It's easier to budget into forecast because forecast, you're going to know how much money you need to support that debt. The interest of that um, repayment is tax deductible, so you're going to have a, a total payment. The portion that's going towards the principal is not deductible, but the interest portion is, so something to consider. Um, and the biggest reason is it really allows you to maintain full control over your business. Um, so you're not giving away a piece of it. The lender doesn't want a piece of what you've built. They really just want certainty that they're going to get paid back with interest. Any questions on that? Okay, great. So some cons related to financing. So that expected repayment starts immediately with the interest. Um, they want want that money coming back and it's gonna come back according to schedule. Um, there's going to be exposure for default. So most likely if you're buying a piece of equipment, they're going to want that piece of equipment to be collateral to the loan. And if you default or look to default on that loan, there's a potential that that will come back um, to the lender, allowing to them to acquire those assets. They probably have financial covenants related to those. And financial covenants are really financial ratios that the bank's going to require to allow them to feel comfortable that they're going to be able to get repaid. So the most common one related to the industry is probably the debt service coverage. They want to know that you have enough operating income left at the end of the day to make those debt payments or they're not gonna lend to you knowing that you're not gonna have that cash flow available to come back to them. Um, there may also be additional reporting. So the banks are either gonna require internal financial statements on a monthly, quarterly, or annual basis. They may require CPA prepared financial statements um, at some level of assurance, whether it's a compilation, a review, or an audit, depending on how much um, that relationship is for them. So turning to the f equity side of financing, uh, there's a lot of different sources out there. Um, a lot of companies, and in this industry especially, start off with the friends and family route. So when you're trying to get off the ground, you've probably reached out to your network that's immediately available um, for that investment. Customers or friends of the brewery um, are an, a potential source of equity, groups or other social clubs that you're a member of, 
an angel investor, if you can find that you know, rich great uncle that's looking to invest somewhere, you can certainly use him for equity. Um, all the way to a venture capitalist, which is either an investor or a group of investors that is looking to invest in a business. Um, they're looking for growth, so they're going to want to see their investment turn into something over the years, but certainly not as quickly as that debt repayment looks for them. Some pros related to equity financing. Uh, the biggest one you have built-in brand ambassadors. So your friends and family um, are probably customers. If you are investing with you know, friends of the brewery, they're probably going to come in and spend their money. So it's a built-in revenue stream for you. Um, they are not looking for an immediate repayment term. They're in it for a long, the long run, or certainly a longer run than the bank is. Um, not looking for that money to come back to them right away. This is a great option if you don't have that cash flow available. So it's an infusion of cash, but they're not looking for necessarily a dividend payment to come back out um, a year or two in advance, a year or two down the line. So those opportunities for you to take in that cash and not pay it out, but they are getting a piece of the ownership. And the target list of investors is long depending on your network. So there's different sources available out there for you. It's not all roses, though. Um, so the biggest problem there is that competing initial goal. Um, so you, as the brewery, really want to take in as much cash as you possibly can from this investment while giving away the smallest amount of equity that you can. Um, and the investor wants the exact opposite of that. So that competing goal will be um, a period of negotiations, certainly not a quick way to get through that. You'll probably have to go through the negotiations. You'll probably have to do a valuation of the company to figure out what does that, you know, $500,000 investment, what does that look like? Is that half my business? Is that 25%? What does that number look like? And I know uh, my coworker Scott came in and talked about valuations yesterday. That's a, a touchy subject, as long as everyone is equally unhappy with the number that comes back on the valuation, the seller and the buyer, you're probably somewhat close to what that number should be. Um, nobody wants to overpay or underpay, so it's, a, it's an art for sure. Um, but considerations for the future. So at some point, the investor is going to want to either take their money out um, at a premium. They're going to want some return on that investment. They want, might want a dividend or some sort of a distribution to come back to them um, because it is an investment to them. Um, it's permanently parting with part of your business. So you've built um, the company to the point where it is now. And maybe 5% doesn't look like a lot right now, but what does 5% look like down the road? Is that something that? you want to part with right now. Um, you're bringing more cooks into the kitchen. Are they going to want to say in how the business is run? Are they going to want to say in you know, different areas that you're getting into? Or are they going to be somewhat of a silent investor? That's something to certainly keep in mind as you're going through. Um, and the last question, does your business structure really even allow for this? Are you set up as a partnership? Are you set up as an LLC? But things to consider as you're growing is, will, would my business even support this, um, this type of offering? So those are probably the two biggest ways to get a cash infusion um, to grow the business, as it's important. But the brewery doesn't have to look for that type of an infusion in order to grow. You know, you can look for organic ways, and one of those is tax credits. So that's what we're going to talk about next. Um, we're going to talk about, I'll call them operating um, tax credits. So these are things that are going to just keep the money within your brewery. And then we'll talk about the investment type tax credits, which are, as you're expanding, you can see. First one is the FICA tip credit. Um, I'm certainly not looking for anyone to take my job, so I'm not going to explain exactly how this goes down. Um, but the biggest thing I want you to take out of here is this is really a credit based on the FICA and Medicare that you're paying um, above and beyond the tipped employee, uh, the minimum wage on those tipped employees. Um, and the best way to figure out if you're taking this credit is if your CPA is asking for 
your paychecks FICA tip credit report or a tipped credit report. If they're not, I would ask the CPA, or I would ask the payroll company for that and provide that to your CPA. The form is 8846, it's in your return, but if you have tipped employees and they're making above the minimum wage with that tipped amount, you will be eligible for this credit. So just keep that in mind that this is just one more way to kind of keep that money within your brewery. Yeah. How, how do we see that, that, that money when you know, look at, like, where does that money go? Oh, it's, it's the, so the 8846 is a form which is in your um, income tax return. So it's part of your return. It'll come back as a credit. Okay. Yep. Any other questions on that? Does that money come from the employees? It does not. It comes from the government. Yeah, so that's, um, let me see if I can go back. Yeah, so this is, it's a credit rate um, from the IRS. So it will be calculated at the 7.65% of the amount that's between the, of the amount of the excess tips above the minimum wage amount. So the next one is the workers opportunity tax credit. And as you're taking on new employees, this is really focused on new employees. So as the business is growing and you're taking on those new employees, um, it's a federal tax credit that's aimed specifically to American job seekers that are historically um, harder to find employment, harder to, to join the, uh, the ranks. And those are defined by the government as um, these targeted groups. So formerly incarcerated, SSA recipients, veterans, um, residents of empowerment zones, which are geographic regions, um, and chronically unemployed as defined as over 27 weeks of unemployment. So this calculates at 40% of the first $6,000 of wages paid to those employees. Um, they are, this is for new employees only, so you've got to go through the screening process and it, it, the screening process has to be complete on the day of hire or the day before hire. So don't think of employees that you have within your walls right now, but certainly as you're looking to, to add people to your staff, this is one way to kind of bring more money in-house. Uh, New York State does have a similar program, so this work opportunity credit is a federal program, but there is a New York State hire a vet program, um, which kind of taps into the same targeted group of veterans. So certainly something to consider if you have a, a veteran that you're looking to hire, um, definitely something to explore. The fuel tax credit, so this is really just aimed at giving you a tax credit for the gasoline that you're using for off-road vehicles, um, whether that be warehouse equipment, forklifts, et cetera. So you're not paying the fuel tax on those type of miles. Um, so keeping track of this is key. It makes the uh, IRS dirty dozen list, which is um, not as sexy as it sounds, and really just looks to, to try to curb all the tax credits that are exploited more than the other ones. Um, so if you're applying for the fuel tax credit, you really gotta keep track of your documentation on those miles and on those gallons. Um, but certainly a credit that could, could add up after time. Yeah? Are these credits refundable or are they go against your tax code? It depends, it depends. It, the, most of them are refundable. Um, some of them will be carried forward. So it depends why which one. Um, the research and development tax credit. So this we've talked about for a number of years. Um, it's a tax credit available to breweries and other industries um, that are developing new or improved business components that result in functional improved functionality, performance, reliability, or quality. Um, there's four criteria to this credit. Um, technical uncertainty, uh, a process of experimentation, technological in nature or based in the sciences. Um, I always joke with Chris that he really is a mad scientist in the back of his brewery. There is a tremendous amount of science, as you know, within this brewing process. So just about everything qualifies 
in some regard in that technological in nature um, notion, and it has to be for a qualified purpose. Um, this is a credit that I think gets underutilized in this industry because you're thinking, I might be new to this, but Chris is doing this, or you know, the big guys are doing this. This has to be new to you. It has to be new within your brewery. So if you're doing a process that we're talking about or we'll talk about next, that maybe another brewer has already perfected, you haven't perfected it. So there could be qualifications that you're going to be able to take this credit. Certainly something to explore. So how to claim the credit. This became a little more complicated this year, um, thanks to the federal government. So we'll talk about this later. Um, but it's possible to claim it against your payroll taxes as well. So. This, as a, the define, definition of a startup company for this credit is gross receipts of less than five years, less than $5 million in gross receipts in the year that the credit is elected, but you don't have to have tax liability in order to claim this credit. It can go against payroll taxes. So then these are just some examples um, of the list of processes that could potentially qualify. I just wanted to get your thoughts ranging here. So we've got different hopping techniques, um, improvements to the manufacturing um, process that we're looking to improve the product volume or diversity, um, package changing to either ensure or improve the, the shelf life of your product, different recipes, different fermentation methods, different hopping methods, new ingredients or uh, flavor enhancements, and a variety of quality control testing. So all of things that are well within the range of probably every brewery here. Yeah? Um, so maybe not a, a recipe change, but if you just change the label, or maybe for an app. Well, so not not for more visibility if it's looking to improve the product. So not in terms of I'm trying to drive the consumer to consume this beverage, but if you're changing the label to improve the product, the label's probably not a great example, but if you were changing how you were canning something in order to keep it fresh longer, something like that. Something to improve the product that way certainly would qualify. Yeah? What what qualifies? Is it the entire cost of manufacturing that particular? Well, I didn't plant this question, but it's perfectly timed. Um, so the things that are going to qualify are wages that go into that process. So probably not the entire time of the brewers, but the time that the brewer is spending on that piece of improving the process, his time, as well as any supplies related to that. Um, any tangible property other than you're buying a new tank for this purpose. It can't be depreciable property, it can't be land, um, but any other supply that goes into this process. In addition, any payments to a third party that's performing those same research and development activities on your behalf. So if you're utilizing a lab to you know, check on the quality control of something or looking to improve something, but you're, you're sending that out or you're bringing a lab person into the brewery, that time is also eligible for this credit. So they couldn't leave well enough alone. Um, so the R&D tax credit did change this year. And instead of just expensing um, that uh, payroll and supply expense, we're now required to capitalize those costs and amortize them over a five-year period. Um, this gets into a little bit more complication. Of course, there's a longer period for federal research. Um, they've tried to repeal this a million times between when they passed this law and 1-1 when it became um, implemented, and they continue to suggest new legislations to repeal this. Nothing has stuck yet, so we're under the same rules, um, but we continue to wait. Um, the one thing I want to take out from this is that if your R&D tax, if your R&D expenses are normalized, so let's say you spend $100,000 a year, about um, year over year, 
eventually you will get to the same point because you'll be amortizing that same $100,000 year over year. You'll get 20 of the first year, 40 of the second year, 60 of, you know what I mean? So it's really a timing difference of when those uh, qualified expenses can be expensed in the amortization and you will receive the credit which calculates about 16% um, depending on you know a bunch of different factors it's usually 16% of those qualified expenditures but in the first year so if you had a hundred thousand dollars of R&D expenses this year you would have a higher taxable income than you would have last year because you're not allowed to take those a hundred percent anymore yeah. I had a question about including wages. You know, if someone wears multiple hats, do you, how do you document that? It's really based on, so as long as you're documenting it and we have a, a methodology to our madness, um, if you let's say your brewer spends 80% of his time making your flagship recipes, nothing's changes, and then he's spending 20% of his time on something outside the zone. So as long as you could do you could do it that way, you could do it by recipe. So this recipe is gonna take, you know, four hours of my brewer's time, it's gonna take this much ingredients, and this is all R and D qualifications. Yeah. You could do it a, a couple different ways. The biggest thing is documentation because as with any tax credit, it could potentially get challenged. So uh, I like the percentage method. Yeah. So is it just documenting, like clocking in, working on something different, or is a straight percentage saying, hey, we devote this much time to these activities and this much time to new rescue development? Is that acceptable? Or you, like yeah, policy? absolutely. Yep, you could do either way as long as it's documented, as okay. long as you've got some justification. I mean, uh, as accountants, we have to keep our time down to the six minutes. Um, I'm certainly not going to tell anybody's brewer that they have to do that as terms of I'm doing the flagship stuff, I'm doing this, I'm not having that argument with anyone. But if you can say, you know, 20% of my time is spent here, or, you know, Monday, or like typically one day a week I'm doing X, Y, and Z, or maybe Mondays I do quality control, so I know most of that time is spent on this R&D. So as long as you have a justification and you're not being completely aggressive, like, oh, I never brew the same thing twice, yeah. you know. I, it's, exactly, <laughs> yes. That's going to get audited. <laughs> and how, how would that apply to startup? Because that kind of thing is like almost everything you're doing is R&D. So how, how would you leverage it there? Say that again? If you're in a startup position. Oh, in a startup. Yeah. Um, Yes and no. So you're probably brewing a different recipe each time, but are you brewing it? Like, what is your motivation for that? You're not just trying to get product. Are you trying to improve the process? So maybe you're, you know, changing one thing each time to, to try to hone in on that. That's more of a gray area than if you're like, I've never dry hopped before, so this is a complete new thing for me. So it it's somewhat of a gray area, um, but again, as long as you're documenting, that's really the key. Anybody else? Yeah. Is it uh, W-2 wages only or A-1 as well? W-2 wages, yep. Anything else? Excellent. So then some specific New York State um, uh, tax credits. Um, this is really, hang on, let me catch up. This is really based on equipment purchases. So the investment tax credit is a credit on qualified property, uh, which is defined as tangible property, depreciable, located in New York State, principally used um, by the taxpayer for manufacturing, farming, assembling, etc. A useful life of over four years, which is not hard to do. This credit does include storage material, so keep that in mind as you're doing manufacturing. Um, storage materials are included in this. Um, biggest thing, the, the property that you're including here cannot be taken under 179 as well. So 179 is the 
accelerated depreciation method where if you buy something you can write off the whole depreciation in the current year if you're doing 179 um, you can't take advantage of this credit so it's somewhat of a game is it easier 179 is really a timing difference right you're not getting more depreciation you're just getting it faster you're taking more of an expense in the year that you buy it so does it make more sense if you're incurring losses or you're not getting taxable income to instead take the normal method of depreciation and take advantage of this investment tax credit that might be true because you're just not building up your nol as well not building up your um, accumulated losses as quickly but you're getting advantage of this new york state investment tax credit so certainly something to to keep in mind in a conversation to really have with your cpa and and from a timing perspective um, the, the tax credit's based on 5% of the first $350 million, 4% uh, above that number. Um, there is an enhancement for additional employment, so if you are making the argument that you're creating jobs with this um, new equipment, there's an enhancement um, that may be available as well. The manufacturer's real property taxes, this is really just the 20% the of eligible real estate property paid, real estate property taxes paid if you're a manufacturing facility um, principally used for manufacturing, processing, assembling, et cetera. So keep that in mind as you're paying those New York State real estate taxes. Um, the pass-through entity tax, um, this is, somewhat of a new thing. I think we're settling into it a little bit. Again, really only comes into play if you are making um, taxable income. So as you're starting up, you may not be in that position, but this is really allowing um, companies or pass-through entities, partnerships, S-Corps to pay that income tax for New York State at the um, entity level versus letting that taxable income flow to you on a K-1 and then paying it on an income tax level on your 1040. Um, really aimed at circumventing the $10,000 limit on SALT on the 1040 when we went through all of that back in 2017. This is New York State's work around that. So may not be applicable for everyone. Um, it's an annual election, but if you're making taxable income, um, certainly something to, something to keep in mind. You have to do that annual election by March. So we've missed the deadline, March 15th. So we've missed the deadline this year, but if you anticipate having taxable income in your pass-through entity in 2024, certainly something to consider. This is my favorite one, because it's an easy one, um, and the Brewers Association fought real hard for this one, so this is really just the credit, um, production credit based on those excise taxes that are paid. It's calculated at 14 cents per gallon on, on the first half million gallons, 4.5 cents on the 500 to 15.5 gallons produced. Um, easiest way to figure out if you're getting this credit is if your accountant is asking you how much you brew. Um, they're not curious, they're taking this credit for you. But if you're not getting asked that question, I would provide that answer of this is how much I'm brewing, these are my you know, 456 reports, and I would like to take this credit. So something to keep in mind. Um, do want to point out, though, so this is claimed on your individual tax return. It comes through, if it's a pass-through entity, it comes through on your K-1. So let's say you're a 50-50 owner, that's going to come through on your individual tax return. So it's going to come from the corporate, but it's going to pass through to your individual. Does that make sense? Yep. They pay the excise tax every year, and then we get a credit back for that? You get a credit back on your individual, yeah. Yes, but but it's not it's Personal. not one. Uh, yes, on your 1040. So, uh, well, it depends how you're set up. I'm yeah. guessing you're a pass-through entity, and it's probably going to come through on your K-1. But certainly something we can I can yeah. walk through on an individual basis. Anything else? Okay. I just added this slide because 
New York State's always a little wonky, and um, in 2021, they signed into law a requirement that small employees, uh, small employers um, either um, allow their employer, set up a 401k plan for their employees, a retirement plan, or they are required to join this state-run 401k plan. Um, it's supposed to come through in 2023, the year that we're currently in. I don't think they've worked out all of the kinks yet, but I'm guessing that most everyone will fall under this as a, a required participant, at least 10 employees. You've been in business two years. You don't offer a 401k or retirement plan for the preceding two years. And it applies to everyone, profit, for-profit, non-profit. So just something to keep in mind as you're going through the year. Um, they do also offer um, some incentive to set up your own 401k plan within uh, some sort of a uh, retirement plan system for your employees. So they'll give you a portion of those startup costs as a credit if that's something you want to do for your employees on your own versus joining the state run one. Again, this is supposed to come through in 2023. No guarantees. And then last but not least, how am I doing on time? Okay. Good. Um, so last but not least, I do want to talk about the employer retention credit. Um, so this is, again, as a result of COVID, um, there were two phases of this plan, 2020 and 2021. Uh, 2020 was based on 50% of up to $10,000 per employee per year. So that gets you to the five. And then 2021 was a 70% credit up to 10 grand per employee per credit. So that is per quarter. Um, which gets you the $21,000 coming to a 26, and that's where the 26 is coming through on the million of commercials that I'm sure you've all heard. Um, so what this is really doing is it's a credit on your 941, which is your payroll tax return. And the reason I continue to talk about it is because that number, uh, that payroll tax return has to be amended the first one would be, the first time this would have been eligible would have been the wages paid 313.20 through 630.20. So if you're taking advantage of any of that portion, it needs to be amended by three years from the file date, which would have been in July of 2020. So you've got to amend it by July of 2023. So we're starting to see the sunset of that credit. Um, if you're going to go back and amend. At this point, that's the only option is to amend the 941s. Um, a lot of people are eligible for this credit. Um, not a, a lot of people took advantage of this credit throughout the program, so you very well may have already taken advantage of it. Um, but as that continues to sunset, I think you'll start ramping up the number of people that are talking about this, you know, and that, that time frame is shrinking. Um, so wanted to make sure everybody kind of understood this credit and could at least initially determine if they're eligible. Um, so eligible employees are ones that are carrying out a trade or business in 2020, a full or partial suspension of operations due to government orders. We'll get into that or what that means in a, in a bit. Or the black and white definition is a 20% reduction in gross receipts. And that's calculated on a quarter by quarter basis. So we'll get into that a little bit, but don't just look at the tax returns. We're really looking at you know Q2 of 2019 versus Q2 of 2020 and whether that number went down 20%. Um, I'm guessing that almost everybody in here um, is less than 500 employees. So that means all of your wages are eligible for this credit excluding anything that's already been claimed in a COVID type credit. So if you put your brewer's $5,000 time on the PPP loan application forgiveness, that specific time is not eligible for this credit. If you utilize that in the Restaurant Revitalization Act, those aren't eligible as well. So it's not exclusive of an individual 
but it is exclusive of that amount of time. So let's say you used $30,000 of somebody's $60,000 wages, you've got $30,000 that's eligible potentially, but you can't double dip and say 60 over here, 60 over there. Does that make sense? Okay. So the steps to determine um, the definition of an eligible um, employer, we talked about full of suspension operations, and that's probably the grayest area. Um, certainly a lot of firms out there that are calculating this credit and have developed databases that say, in Rochester, New York, this was the government mandate of the day for you know July and August. There was a time when all of the tap rooms were closed. I know that was a long time ago, thank God, but um, it was during 2020, right? There was a time when you were measuring tables to make sure that they were six feet apart. There was a time when you had to figure out, you know, my fire code said I can have 100 people in here, but I can only have 50 because I can't space everyone out. So those are all potential government orders that are changing your business. So may be applicable, something to certainly explore. Um, so direct um, suspension of any operations, restricted operations, um, suspension of any suppliers or buyers, if you are having a hard time getting product, that kind of thing are all things that will come into play with this credit. So if you look at a quarter by quarter and say, you know, quarter by quarter I'm not down 20%, although I'd be hard pressed to think nobody was down that 20%, especially in those quarters that you were closed um, or certainly suspended, even if you don't qualify just in this black and white method, there's other ways to, to look at that. So certainly worth, in, worth a question, worth exploring. Uh, qualifying the wages, we've talked about this, you can't double dip. Um, the phase one, phase two really depended on the number of employees, but it was less than 100 in 2020, less than 500 in 2021. That doesn't mean you have to have less than that number of employees, that just means like the, the rules are different. Uh, I can't double dip and they excluded family, so we, we can't take advantage of those. Claiming the credit, um, so at this point your only option is to file an amended 941. Um, the statute of limitations that we talked about is three years. Um, you can't double dip, so the amount is not deductible. So if you took advantage of the PPP program, um, when you went to file your taxes, that was a um, non-taxable income. This is a reduction in your expense. So letter of the law, you should go back, if you claim a credit in 2020, you're gonna to need to go back and amend your 2020 to reduce your payroll expenses, which is gonna either increase your taxable income or probably reduce your net operating loss going forward. But those should be amended for, for that change. Um, certainly something to talk to your accountant about, but wanna make sure that everyone knows you are, it is going to change the taxable income or your NOL level going forward because that is a reduction in the expense. Any questions on that? Yeah. This is such a convoluted thing and just like everybody else in this room, I'm sure I'm not the only one getting phone calls three times a week yep. saying I should take advantage of this. Yeah. Um, what is, are you finding that it's worth working with a third party to do this and if so, what is a reasonable percentage to pay? Sure, that's a great question. Um, so there are a couple of considerations for this. Um, there are a million places that are doing this and you're probably getting a million phone calls a day. Um, I would probably exclude anyone that has ERC in their name because that means that they haven't done a tax credit before 2020 and they're probably not going to do one before after 2022 because that's when this came about, right? So there are a number of, I'll call them boutique tax credit firms that we've worked with in the past um, that have focused very heavily on R&D tax credits, um, cost segregation studies, those, they're not filing your tax return on a daily basis, but they are looking for these one-off opportunities. Um, and there's a lot of reputable ones out there. So I would 
steer you towards one of those. Um, we work with one somewhat exclusively. Um, they do a great job. And the biggest question I would ask if I were in your shoes is what's going to happen when this number gets audited? Because at some point, this number is going to get audited, right? Like, we haven't seen a tremendous amount of audits yet, but they're still catching up. They're still paying out the credit, let alone coming back to audit that number. So, well, a lot of firms will charge you that 20%. The bigger question is, you can charge me 20%, but are you going to stand up for me when it gets audited? And, Scott, I don't know if you want to talk a little bit about um, the company that we've used. They historically have provided that audit support for an R&D tax credit for all of their boutique services, and that's additional. That's not additional revenue for them. That's not an additional cost to you. So that 20% that they're charging and taking off the top is almost their insurance policy, right? Like they know that they're going to have to stand up for that number, um, so they're going to be aggressive enough to get you as much as they can slash I'm going to charge you 20% because I know I'm not going to collect another dollar when this goes through an audit process. So that's a reasonable percentage, 20%, if they're going to cover you for the audit. I would, yeah, I would think, I, I, would, I think 20% is probably the norm. Again, this isn't set in stone. The IRS isn't dictating that 20%, so asking's free, right? right? You, can, you can ask for a lower fee, and maybe they'll ask you to do a little bit more work. I think I would err on the side of going with a firm that's going to do the audit support, right. though, more than trying to negotiate that fee down. Like, that's what I would hang my hat on. Yeah, so I, my experience with this is um, I, I think the first question you should ask is what are you doing when I get audited? Do I have to pay you more money or is that already included in the fee? If it's, if it's not, they're going to charge you a lot of money or you're going to have to pay your CPA a lot of money to right. support you. So think about that. Um, it is definitely a negotiable thing, so they're going to try to not get you to negotiate, but I have seen several firms push back and say, hey, 20 is too much, you know, how about 10? They'll meet in the middle of 15, so I think any firm will will negotiate that a little bit for you. But Kate's right, anybody with ERC in their name and just started, uh, and would shy away from that. Yeah, I'm working with a company, and I'm not sure if this is sketchy or not, but they said if I pay them um, prior to getting the money, it's 10%. Hmm. I pay them after I get the money, it's 18%. And they guarantee that they will um, get more out of it that they <coughs> work. Yeah, I, I think everyone's probably going to get to a business model that makes sense for them as the accounting firm, you know. And I agree, like, they're taking on a little more risk if they're waiting for you to get paid for them to get paid, you know. So, of course, they're going to take a little bit more of a haircut off the top if you're if you're waiting for them. So some of that comes down to cash flow, right? Like are you are you willing to, to take the discount right now, but you'll be out that cash um, without necessarily receiving the, the benefit of that yet. Um, but again, I like I feel like the, the thing that's wagging the dog, the tail is the audit support. And as long as they're going to support you in audit for not an additional fee. Um, that's really what I would look for within this realm. And the other question to ask is, if you do get audited and for some reason the IRS uh, denies 100% of the credit or a portion of the credit, asking that provider if they give you a discount on the fee too. Sure. Mm -hmm. So if you're paying 20% on the, on the gross amount and then the audit knocks it down to 50%, are you getting a reduction in the fee or a credit back? So some providers are doing that, others are not. So another good question. Yeah, and again, I, some of that comes down to do they have ERC in the name because are they going to be there in three years, number one, to provide the audit support, and number two, to pay you back if mm -hmm. this credit does get knocked down. So I've had a lot of... Um, companies that have applied for this credit um, not a ton have gone through audit at this point um, but we're really waiting for it you know and some have taken the approach as I'm going to put that in a separate piggy bank and when that statute of limitations goes 
I'm going to buy whatever I want with it. You know, I'm going to use that as my rainy day fund. Others have taken the approach to kind of use that in the operating. And that, again, comes down to what are your needs. You might not be in the position to be able to put that aside for a little while. But there is exposure there. Um, not from not from the credit not being legit, but from you know, the, the gray area of that suspension of operations and the, the outstanding audits there. I think that's it, right? Is that all I got? Yeah, so if there's any other questions, um, I'm happy to have you guys shout them out or if you wanna come up later, yeah. Uh, we've investigated doing the R&D credit over the last few years, um, tracking it, documenting it, all that is kind of it's however we want to do it. Do you know, is there like a template, a form, something that when, if there is an audit, it's just, you know, the form, whatever it is, and it's, it's all laid out there, so it's, it's easy to understand what we were doing. Yeah, there's not necessarily like a proprietary form that I can give you. Um, I think it's a lot of back and forth with your accountant as to, did you consider this? Have we docu- like, it's providing the audit support before that comes, right? So that's what you're really preventing is getting caught with this R&D tax credit that you don't have the support behind. So I think a lot of it is documenting the steps that are required, what you're doing, the justification for either the percentage of time or the actual time, what your brew is actually doing, what the QC guy is really doing. So a lot of it, I think, just comes down to conversations and then documenting those conversations. So I work with MMV. I do my tax return. Um, Kurt and I, another person that's here, uh, set up, work together over you know, a couple of weeks and set up a spreadsheet. So now every year he sends me that spreadsheet. I just, you know, I can look back and see which ones I've done before, which ones I haven't. You know, we've, we worked on the percentages that we think are right for the payroll. We make sure the payroll number for my brewers is correct. And then, you know, I put that in and spits it all out and they put it in there. So we have like every year we've got it documented, but they helped set up that spreadsheet uh, for it. Yeah. Yeah. And I, I think, like I said, like it, that's just documentation, right? And the way Chris does it, may not equate to the way you want to do it, but as long as you have a method behind that madness, I think you will be fine. We've just got to have that conversation and work through, like, how do you keep track of their time? How do you keep track of these? Do you want to do it by recipe? Do you want to do it by day? Like, what makes sense to you? And then we can kind of craft a, an approach. Do you think Kurt will share that with Morty so that then I can get <laughs> through it as well? Yeah, that's good. Yeah, that's good. Yeah, I, mean, I, I highly recommend MMB. Like, right? so, yeah. Thanks, there. Chris. So, yeah, I'm sure they'll, they'll I mean. I'll be writing for you shortly. Yeah, yeah exactly. So, you know, make call, I'll show you. I was just going to say that, like, whether you were, choose to work with MMB or it's really important. I mean, there's so much technical information in here that, and it's always changing. So, even if you feel like you have it right now and for this session, by next year, sure there's going to be something different. And, so I know it's scary to go to a firm that specializes in your industry because the thought is they're going to be expensive or they're big and I can afford that where I am in my room yet. But it's so important that you find um, professional advisors in all of your areas that know your industry. Because while you might invest a little bit more for the service, what you're going to save and in, in whether it's tax credits on your taxes or you know insurance policies or whatever, they're going to know exactly what you need um, and help you save most of the time, more dollars than what you're paying them. Mm -hmm. um, so make sure you just find that expertise. Yeah, and all that's more than the two years we've been hoping to switch it from a CPA to a CPA. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. And they're twice as expensive, but it looks. Yeah. It's well spent. Right, yeah. Well, thanks, guys. Um, I'll be around if you have any questions.